1, Part 2, Part 3, and Part 4. Now look at Part 1. Part 1. Here a student called Joanna, telling her friend about an arts festival, which is being held in the city where they are studying. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 and 2. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 and 2. Hi, Joanna. Where have you been? Hi, Dave. I had to go into college to return a DVD I'd borrowed from the library. Oh, right. But while I was there, I got some information about the City Arts Festival that starts next week. Oh, yeah. I saw a poster advertising it somewhere. Yeah. And I picked up this leaflet from the library. It gives you the website address. So as I was there, I logged on to get more information. Actually, although they've got the full programme of events fixed now, you can't book online, which seems strange. There's a number to phone, though. Hmm. And are there student discounts? I guess so, but I didn't notice. Anyway, there are three things I'd like to see. An Italian film, a rock concert and an art exhibition. Oh. <laughs> the exhibition's free and you don't need to book, so I'll definitely go to that. But I'm going to get tickets for the film in case they sell out. Mm, good idea. You can always buy concert tickets at the door, because that's in a really big hall. Right. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to read questions 3 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 3 to 10. So, when does the festival actually start? Well, it's usually held the first week of October, but it's earlier this year for some reason. The opening night is September the 20th, and events go on till the end of the month. Hmm. And have you got that phone number? Yeah, it's here. Uh, look, it's 0967 990 776. OK, I'll write it down. 0967 990 776. Thanks. I thought the local council made a profit from the festival, but it says here that there's a commercial sponsor. It's a local bank. I didn't know that. Neither did I. What other events have they got on? Um, as well as the art exhibitions and stuff that's open every day, there are special events each day. Like on Monday, there's a musical in the City Hall. Uh. That's only £3.65 for students. Mm, I think I'll give that a miss. I've got football training on Mondays, but I'm free on Wednesday. There's a jazz band on then, and that's only £2.50 for students. Sounds good. Is that in the City Hall too? We could go. Well, I'm busy actually, but it's at the Sports Centre if you're interested. Oh, 
Right. Thursday's the cheapest event, only one pound twenty-five for students, and it's on in the library. Can you guess what it is? <laughs> Probably the college choir. <laughs> Actually, no. They've not been asked. Apparently. Oh. No, it's a poetry evening. Hmm. Isn't there any modern dance on anywhere? On Friday, that's at the college. It's quite expensive, though. Fifteen pounds for adults and twelve pounds seventy-five for students. Oh, yes, that is a lot. If I'm going to spend that much, I'd prefer to go out on Saturday. Yeah, me too. But on Saturday night, there isn't live music or a party or anything. Just the fireworks in the city park, and that's only one pound fifty. Yeah, that'd be good. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a conversation between a student and a driving instructor. First, look at questions eleven to fourteen. Listen carefully. Hello, I'm going to be your driving instructor today. Are you ready to begin? Hi. Hope you don't mind. It's my first time driving a car. Of course not. That's my job. I teach people like you how to become a safe and responsible driver. So let's begin. Remember the most important rule of driving: safety first. There are some steps to follow. First, you should put on your seatbelt. You should always remember to do that. In case of an accident or emergency, having a seatbelt on is of utmost importance. Okay, I have my seatbelt on. Now, what should I do? Start the car. Good. Now make sure that the steering wheel is in the proper position, and that your seat is not too far or not too close to the pedals. I'm all ready to go. Should I shift into first gear? Don't forget to put the parking brake down. You don't want to drive with that up. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. If I have the parking brake on, I won't be able to accelerate. Yes, that's right. Now put the car in reverse and slowly back out of the parking space. Good. Put the car in first gear. When should I shift? Is it better to shift slowly or quickly? You can shift whenever you feel is appropriate. This means shifting should occur smoothly. Do not shift too slowly, or you will stall. Shifting too fast will waste gas. Shifting is simple. Just remember to shift smoothly. To shift, you will have to push the clutch and then push the gas pedal. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions fifteen to twenty. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Remember, smoothly is the key to good shifting. Like this? Yes. 
That's good. Now keep it slow. Don't drive very fast just yet. Be sure to constantly check your mirrors for oncoming traffic. Always be aware of everything that is around you, including three important things. Remember these three: people crossing the streets, other cars, and bicycles riding next to you. What should I do if I see a yellow light? Well, it's always better to brake instead of trying to run it. But if you're travelling at a speed where it's impossible to stop in time, then you should try to make it across the intersection. But remember, you should always try to stop. It's the safest way to avoid an accident. Even if I have to brake very suddenly. Yes, even if you have to brake suddenly. What about if a driver behind me is going a lot faster than I am? You should always be ready to move to a slower lane if a driver behind you is forcing you to go faster than you are comfortable with. Never try to speed up to accommodate a faster driver. You could risk an accident or a speeding ticket. It's better to let him go. That sounds like good advice. Be careful. There is a sharp turn up ahead. Remember to brake before turns. Otherwise, you might flip over if your speed is too high going into a turn. Got it. I know that I should always try to observe all traffic safety. That's right. If safety is not your first priority, it will make driving very dangerous for you and other drivers on the road. Okay, park the car here. You did a great job today for your first day. I'll see you in three days. Thanks so much. I will see you then. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two undergraduates doing a research methods course. A girl called Leela and a boy called Jake having a seminar with their tutor. Now you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Now listen and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. So the task I gave you both was to choose an article about a small-scale research project. Yes. yes. You were then required to try to reproduce the research procedures in your own context, i.e., try it out for yourselves. Yeah, and that's what we've done. Great. So I'd like you to tell me a bit about the article and why you chose it. Well. The article's written by two university lecturers who had started using crosswords to help their students revise terminology for exams. And the crosswords were designed and set on computers. And we selected the article because, well, it seemed an accessible topic, even though we weren't familiar with the technique. You know, using IT to design crosswords for higher education. That's a good reason. So these lecturers wanted to see how well this innovation was received by their students. Yes. So how did you go about reproducing the research? Well, we drew up a list of terms from one of our own modules, and designed a crossword for revising these terms. Then we asked our classmates to try out the crossword and give us feedback. You know, their opinions on how they felt about using the technique. Was it easy to find participants? It wasn't easy at first, but then we convinced them that by taking part in the research, they were actually benefiting themselves by preparing for an exam, which is coming up later this term. And it worked. Good. 
So how did you find out what the students thought about doing the crosswords? A questionnaire. The original article used a two-page long questionnaire. There were lots of excellent questions on it, but the whole section on difficulties using IT is now obsolete. Old-fashioned, even. Even though it had only been written a couple of years ago. So you designed a shorter version? Yeah. Then we sent it to the 40 students by email and got 28 replies. I was taken aback by the fact that everybody we talked to thought this was a good return. I mean, the responses were well written. You know, people had taken a lot of care. But I was really disappointed with the low numbers. Yes, an important lesson to learn for an apprentice researcher. <laughs> yeah. Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So what results did you get? Well, basically, the responses were extremely positive. The students said that doing the crossword on a computer helped them really focus on the work in hand and not be distracted, which is something that commonly happens with other ways of doing revision. Yeah, that was really clear. But something that struck me was that having fun hardly featured in their responses, nor did anything to do with spelling of hard words, which I thought would be an obvious benefit. No? Okay. Respondents also said that doing the crossword hadn't really increased their general motivation to study, but that it had highlighted the gaps in their memory so they knew what further work was necessary. Right. So how did your findings tally with those of the original researchers? There were lots of similarities, but... Uh... There were probably two main differences. We found that more males than females liked the technique, whereas the original study found the reverse. Also, our respondents said they wouldn't mind doing a crossword as a final official exam, whereas in the original study, students said they would hate doing it, even if it meant having a shorter test. But of course, both sets of respondents said they'd be interested in doing more crosswords for informal purposes, revision and so forth. Right. So let's have a think about the whole project and what you've learned from doing it. Well, it was very time-consuming. <laughs> yeah, and I don't think we managed that aspect very well. <laughs> it could have been worse. I mean, we didn't have a lot of data, so we didn't have to spend ages processing it. And, of course, we'd already done a course on numerical data processing, so there wasn't much new there. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, I think we designed our questions well so that they gave us manageable data. Yeah, it really helped having the original study to guide us, as it were. And that helped us to see what a good research instrument is. What a good questionnaire should be like. Absolutely. We got a lot from that. But when we were writing up the project... I'm not sure whether we'll know how to acknowledge the work of the original study. You know, our referencing. No, that's something we'll both have to work on in the future. Actually, that part's been great. Finding ways to share and support another person. That's the real plus from the project. Learning ways to do that. Well, it's obviously been very successful. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You're going to listen to a talk about tea in the UK. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. During the 1930s, there was a popular song which had the title Everything Stops for Tea, and to millions of British people, a restful cuppa is still an ideal way to relax for a few minutes from the rigours of the day. The English custom of drinking tea has its roots in the 17th and 18th centuries. When first imported to Britain, the exotic cha, cha or cha, as the Chinese tea was variously called, was considered a man's drink to be enjoyed with colleagues at London coffee shops. These were popular meeting places for many walks of life, politicians, lawyers, poets, actors and writers. Many London clubs began in this manner, and the famous Lloyd's Insurance underwriters started out as Lloyd's Coffee House. In 1706, the first coffee house that offered tea was Tom's Coffee House, owned by Thomas Twining. He realised that he needed to introduce an added attraction to compete with the many other coffee houses in London, and tea was rare, exotic and extremely expensive. With these credentials, tea became an exclusive drink and enabled Twining to open a tea shop under the sign of the Golden Lion in the Strand. By the 18th century, the ladies of the more affluent classes were going China mad, using tea as an excuse for displaying their extravagant purchases of Chinese porcelain and Dresden tea sets. A comprehensive tea tray would consist of a teapot and stand, teacups and saucers, sugar bowl, milk jug and basin for discarded tea and tea leaves. Tea was still expensive and kept in locked tea caddies. Skilled craftsmen fashioned caddies of carved inlaid woods fitted with crystal and precious metals. To ensure the servants weren't tempted by this priceless commodity, the caddy was kept locked and only the mistress of the house held the key and prepared tea when guests came to visit. No well-brought-up young Englishwoman could consider herself socially acceptable unless she knew how to brew a proper cup of tea. As the 18th century progressed, changes in commerce and working hours resulted in the main meal of the day being taken much later in the evening. The prospect of lasting from breakfast until evening did not appeal to the Duchess of Bedford, who is usually credited with being the first to alleviate late afternoon hunger pangs by introducing a small four o'clock meal served with tea. With time, the light, wafer-thin toast or delicate white bread gave way to exotic fillings like tomato and egg, cucumber, chicken or potted shrimps, followed by buttered scones, crumpets or elegant pastries. The popularity of tea continued to spread, but it was not until 1839 that the first shipment of Assam tea, Indian tea was landed in Britain. A healthy trade with India was soon established, and tea clippers, like the Cutty Sark, now a museum in a dry dock at Greenwich, were reaching the peak of their sailing days. In 1879, the first limited shipments of Ceylon tea began to arrive, and by 1880, this had been firmly established alongside Indian and China teas, giving the broad range of teas that are available today. There have been few changes in three centuries of tea trading. London is still the centre, and indeed Twining still has a shop on the site of the original Tom's Coffee House at 216 The Strand. The name Twining has been linked with tea for over 280 years. Indeed, it was Richard Twining, in his capacity as chairman of the dealers of tea, who in 1784 persuaded Prime Minister William Pitt to reduce the high tax on tea, making the beverage more accessible to the general public. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.